you have a kid that's sitting in a high school, an American high school somewhere, who's completely unaware of what's possible in the world. And the distance between them and some of the certifications that you guys are putting people into, the distance is really closed by a couple of things. One, exposure. They just have to know that it, it's something you can do. They see things on TV about somebody wearing a white coat, but they don't realize that there's just all these other ways that of which you could be working in the medical field if you're interested in it. I do yeah. also think that time and money so when you, how much is it going to cost me to go and get this particular degree or certification or AA and how long is it going to take me? Those are all pieces of friction. If it takes me a short amount of time and it's not super expensive and it leads me to somewhere that's going to be productive that I can get this cert and do something in the world. I think there's so many American high school students that need to have as many of those possibilities put before them. Yeah. Other things I think of as friction are transportation time to be in a brick and mortar facility, um, things like childcare, things like, you know, coordinating family, you never know what someone's life looks like on the other side of trying to get into that career, right? Welcome to Vector, another uh, podcast where we discuss math, science, technology, and how it can impact the future of education, the future of learning, and what it can do for our young people to prepare them for the world that uh, is coming and uh, that they're going to inherit. And we have us old people are having to like kind of relinqu relinquish some of the, uh, the, the reins to them. We got to get them prepared. And that's why we want to talk to experts who can help us understand what the issues are. Today, we're talking about bridging the gap, how technology can in impact how we train the healthcare workforce. And as most people know, the healthcare workforce is one of the high wage, high growth uh, occupational uh, classes, which we should be preparing young people for because it's not going to go away. Um, and, and the opportunities are only going to grow. So who are our experts today? Uh, we have Jennifer Kolb, who is the Vice President of Partnerships and Workforce Development for MedCerts. We'll learn more about what MedCerts is and does. And we also have Dana Jansen, who is the Chief Product Officer uh, for MedCerts. And again, we should probably start there. First of all, welcome, you two. Thank you so much for giving your, us your time today. Really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit first, just the most basic question about MedCerts. What is MedCerts? What, what are you disrupting in the world? What are you changing? Like, what are you guys making happen? How are you making dreams come true? What is MedCerts? Well, I guess I can kick it off. So MedCerts is a, an online uh, certification and career training school. And uh, we have a, a broad reach. We're, we're not just a school. We uh, facilitate partnerships, and Jenny can speak to this in more detail, but we facilitate partnerships with academic institutions and uh, businesses and health systems and hospitals all across the country. So the mission and kind of the purpose behind our business is to prepare tomorrow's workforce for in-demand, high-growth, allied health jobs. Um, we also operate within a few other uh, channels or, or subject matter areas like IT and business skills, and we're expanding that outward. But really, you know, uh, our bread and butter and our focus is on allied health. And some people don't know what allied health really refers to. Allied health is a category of healthcare that employs really anything but nurses and physicians. So there, that's a huge, huge area. You know, obviously some. Some examples there would be like medical assistance, phlebotomy technicians, surgical techs, and the like. So um, on the clinical side, you have those types of roles, but then on the administrative side, you might have like medical billing and coding specialists, or you might have um, front office medical assistants. Um, and and there, there's quite a few in both the clinical and the administrative side that we focus on. Um, so that's who we are, and that's who we serve. And, uh, you know, Jennifer, if you want to add anything there, feel free. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better myself, Dana. Um, the disruptive part, I think, is what's really forward thinking of med certs and largely led by Dana and his team, right? The use of technology, the use of building strategic partnerships leading to scalable and, and lasting change because, like you said it, right, we have a generation that is inheriting the world we're leaving behind. And our goal is to to close that workforce gap, especially in healthcare. When you guys think about the technology that you're using, what was the breakthrough? Like, what's the product product here? Like, what's the thing that you said, if we use this technology, we can solve this problem? 
I'll, I'll address this. I, and I love this topic, by the way, because <laughs> good um, geek out on it, man. I, geek I, out on it. Pri- Teach us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had the, the privilege of working with med certs um, for 15 years. So since its inception. And so I've kind of seen the ebbs and flows of, of who med certs is and was all throughout the years. And kind of a, a critical turning point for us came about um, around six years ago. And up until that point, our focus was more on the administrative side of healthcare training. So the billing and the coding, the medical front office, electronic health records, that type of thing. And what we wanted to do was address what we were hearing from the market and talking with employers and just feeling it um, just through osmosis is there was a huge need for training and upskilling for the clinical side of healthcare. So the medical assistance and the like. And that, that can be a challenge. I mean, if you're a distance learning um, institution and, you know, the, the historically medical assistant training has the hands on, has the, you know, excuse my language, but the traditional butts and seats with mm-hmm. the labs and the, you know, the clinicals that go along with it. And it's um, it, it's not easy to pull off within a um, an asynchronous kind of online uh, delivery. So six years ago, we decided, okay, we're going to jump right in and we're going to figure out solutions to this problem. So we established a, a, a pretty broad product team with varying special areas of specialty. And what we really focused in on was how can we bring that clinical experience to the desktop and still rely on a clinical experience in a real world? But how do we adequately prepare someone for day one to be successful mm. on the job, whether that be through an experiential um, job role where they're, they're, they're an extern at a, a clinical site or they're just job ready? So um, we developed a, a team that focused on high fidelity, engaging, um, interactive uh, scenarios or, or, or experiences that allow for hands-on movement on the screen. You can actually move and manipulate tools like you would in the lab. You can interact with individuals virtually and, and really kind of bring that, that what has historically been a, a major challenge for all online providers to address those clinical skills. So, so, so we so focused on that. Let's just stop there right. for a second because sure. I think this part is interesting. So are you an avatar? Like, what is the, how are you doing this online? I want to like feel this like a little bit. Cause like some, let's, for instance, like a blood draw, like, you know, I want to teach you how to do a blood draw. Yeah. How's that happening? So there's a short answer and a long answer. I'll try to give you the short answer. (laughs) Do you have like virtual reality goggles or like, you know, what's happening? We we have those capabilities. So um, not to get too, too deep into the, the technical side and the weeds of things, but we've, we've adopted a, an instructional design methodology that that it's called the David Merrill um, instruction or principles of instructional design. And essentially what that is, is that you teach the theory, you um, you you show how something should be performed, you demonstrate or you allow that student to demonstrate, and then you teach them or you train them on the application of that skill that they've just learned. And so that's an iterative process where you're introducing different techniques at different points to teach on that subject. So to your point, Yes, you can be a virtual avatar in a virtual environment, interacting with a patient or a colleague. Yes, you can be, you can have a patient's arm in a virtual environment and you're taking a, uh, you're, you're taking a syringe and you're actually moving that syringe and in, inserting it into that patient's arm at the right place. And you're, you're prompted to perform additional activities within those steps. Um, and then you are, in, in most cases, shown the proper way to do that, shown that proper way to do that before you're actually prompted to do the, uh, you know, the virtual um, uh, simulation piece. But it, it, it takes all of those steps, the theory, the, the, um, the, the simulation, the demonstration, and the application to pull off those clinical skills. Can't believe how high tech this is getting, uh, yeah. you know, because <laughs> you would, you know, so with with the virtual stuff and distance learning, there are just some things that you don't have enough. Um, if you're a civilian like like I am, you don't have enough imagination of how could you possibly teach some of these in real life skills that need to be taught um, that are so dependent on, like for instance, I have a, a 
program on my laptop that helps you dissect the frog. And those people of a certain age probably remember having to dissect frogs uh, uh, in class. And some of us failed at whatever that was supposed to teach us. Um, but now there's an app on your iPad where you can actually dissect the frog on the, on the iPad. And um, it's remarkable a little bit because, you know, you wouldn't think it can happen. Um, Jennifer, so when you think about, um, you guys have this technology, MedCerts has this way of training and, and um, teaching people, where does the partnerships um, part come in? Who are you partnering with? And what's the nature of like the, the arrangements like that, that uh, make things better for workers? I mean, not, maybe it is workers, but learners, like, you know, how are you guys partnering and who you're partnering with? Yeah, so who is anyone that has people that we want to get in allied healthcare or healthcare IT roles? So um, that can look like workforce offices, community colleges, high school districts, employer partners, all looking to solve two primary issues. Um, one being that in the last five years, the average hospital turned over 106.6, almost 107% of its workforce. And then two, the workforce shortage has caused a financial strain to the tune of $24 billion. So we are looking to partner with anyone who has people, that are interested in careers in those roles. Um, and how we bridge that with technology is to turn people in, over into those jobs at a much faster rate, right? So if you look at the program makeup and, and Dana can speak to that, we are focusing on the core fundamentals, right? Starting with professionalism and allied health, human anatomy and medical terminology, and then typically getting into kind of that capstone course for the job that someone's preparing for. And so by combining our partnerships with local employers or brick and mortar colleges or actually in the high school classroom, right, we're able to give a asynchronous online didactic learning experience paired with some sort of in-person training if needed for a clinical role, right? And then get people into jobs faster so we can decrease that outrageous number of costs incurred and decrease um, the number of people that aren't filling those open roles and that over 100% turnover. Um, are states involved? Like the, when you say workforce yeah. development, is it like the state workforce, workforce development um, arm entity in the state that's working with you? Yeah, definitely. State and federal. Right. So MedCerts is one of the only fully online um, Department of Labor approved apprenticeship provider. Hmm. Right. So we're thinking of apprenticeships and working. We've got a, an in-house grant team that works to build those st strategic partnerships. So working at both the state and the federal level, um, we partner with hundreds of American job centers that are using um state and federal funding, depending on what's available in the region to um, train people with WIOA dollars, with on-the-job training dollars. So there is a ton of support from the federal administration. There is a ton of support from governor and state administrations to say, we need people in healthcare. Um, and you know what we found as of late is there's increased emphasis in the high school realm, right? How do we generate interest with high school students and get them interested in allied healthcare roles early, earlier, um, often, right? We also know that about 95% of healthcare employers offer something called 5250. It's a tuition reimbursement model. So what that means is that a high school student can enroll in a MedCerts program at no cost before they're graduating. They are getting our training program, we are preparing them to sit for a national certification. They pass that certification. The day they graduate high school, the next day, they can go work for a local healthcare system. Having gone through our program, we have a network of university partners that give college credit. Those employers have funding for someone to continue their college degree. So we have built a, a, a pathway, if you will, for a high school student to get into an allied healthcare role, progress from a career perspective and a degree perspective with their employer footing the bill. So we've got, you know, 11th grade in high school to 10 years down the road, road I'm an LPN, I'm a nurse, I've worked at this healthcare system for 10 years, right? And never 
paying a dollar out of pocket. That student never incurs any debt, never has to pay a dime. Um, and that comes from the question you asked, those partnerships. And that happens when you have a college, a workforce department, med certs, an employer, all leaning in to say, how do we solve this crisis together? I just have to say that this is like my, my most, this is the most exciting part for me, really. Um, you know, we talk a lot about education at EdPost. Something I've said a lot is you should graduate after 13 uh, years in a system, you should graduate capable of doing something. Uh, and that something should be capable of putting you into the economic mainstream of America, right? If you're going to spend 13 years in an institution, maybe you should graduate capable of feeding yourself. Um, and But I think that it's mysterious. I used to work in workforce development. I think it's mysterious to a lot of people what's available and what's out there. And we don't have tons of great counseling. So when I think about the field that you guys are focused on, I'm wondering about all these hidden occupations. I know certified nursing assistant. I know nurses um, and phlebotomists. I'm weirdly in touch with that because I used to place people into training programs for that. But then there's, I'm sure, way more like that we're missing. Uh, and so how many certifications do you guys have? It, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but like how many different certifications are possible through you? Well, today we offer... Um, 55 plus unique Jesus. programs <laughs> that lead to about 35 different certifications. The majority of those are, are in healthcare. And those all represent, those certifications represent a job that you can get. I mean, if we're just being very simple about it, they lead yeah, to a job. There's definitely some overlap. So like in a lot of cases, so, you know, one of our, our historically more, more um, in-demand programs is, um, a combination of medical front office and back office. So there's a dual certification that's possible with that that can open up broader job responsibilities, higher demand, um, you know, for uh, for that individual holding those those two certifications. Um, but for the most part, like if you're if you're out to be a medical assistant um, or um, if you're out to be a surgical technician, you're going to go for that cert uh, surgical te technician certification, and then it's really all that you need. Um, in hand as far as certifications go to land that job. I love this. Um, would you be willing to say states that you think are getting it right? Or uh, which ones of your partnerships really feel like they're operating on all cylinders, meaning the the school, the workforce development people, um, the employers are really well aligned and it's really working well? I won't, I won't name names, but... <laughs> I won't name names, but um, I would say check out some of the latest, you know, PR and press releases where we have shared stories with our partners. Um, we have a school district, Farmington R7 in Missouri, that we've worked with. They are doing it right. Um, we have a partnership um, historically where we worked with Cumberland Valley School District in UPMC. They are doing it right. Um, so. I just said I won't name names. I named a few, uh, <laughs> but having been in workforce development yeah. yourself from so long, yeah. for so long, you know, I've been in a ton of these meetings at the conferences. Everyone's in the room, right? But there's always one person, right? Like maybe mm -hmm. the school district is missing. The superintendent's not there, or maybe the community college system is missing, or maybe the employer, the largest healthcare employer is missing, right? So what I have found the states that are doing it the most effectively is when they bring those healthcare associations, consortiums together, not leaving anyone out, right? It is a collective problem that we all have to solve together. You know, if everyone who is unemployed went into the workforce tomorrow, we'd still have gaps, right? So we have to be thinking about firing on all cylinders and, you know, not just high school, but maybe new populations of who's been previously incarcerated, right? Like, how do we get those folks into healthcare, right? There's so many populations that have historically been left out of that workforce development conversation. Uh, and we have to talk about getting them into the workforce. So without naming names, the folks that have everyone at the table together, that is where we are finding our most successful states, our most successful partnerships. 
Well, I did get you to name names, so I just want to like. Did. Yeah, I just want to say. Um, and actually, when I used to do this workforce development work, it was through the welfare to work program. So we were really ah. working at how we could retrain. It was two programs: dislocated worker. So dislocated worker were the people that got uh, dropped out of an industry that was going away. So all of a okay. sudden, the state had like 800 people, and we had to figure out like if the 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 Hormel plant closes or if the Finger Hut plant. Uh, closes the state of Minnesota has to figure out what are we going to do with 800 people um, so they would go through programs like yours um, made available we were doing a poor job of that with welfare to work people um, and that's how I became acquainted with CNA because we started putting more people in the CNA training but there are 33,000 occupations in the United States and I guarantee you most people know like eight of them <laughs> you know yeah. like they do they do not know all all that's available um, and, and, you know, I was going to say Indiana seems like a great state for this because they have their schools and their colleges and their workforce in really good articulation agreements that create very clear pathways. You in Indiana as a student, you know, you can become something very specific just by going to the schools and they make it, they demystify it. They make it kind of obvious. They do a really good job uh, of that. What is, so I want to talk about the problem a little bit more. Um, you said something just a minute ago, like if we really got everybody working, we'd still have gaps. We, we would still have trouble. Is there some sort of impending doom in healthcare that's coming, like some sort of delta that we're going to fall off the cliff and not have enough people to take care of grandma or, yeah, what's, is there a problem that we're about to, to, to witness? I'll answer it and Dana, please, you add to it. I mean, You've seen the stats, right? We've all seen the stats that there will be shortages that we are inherently going to see in the coming years and what those shortages look like at the end of the day, I think we'll figure out, right? We are certainly working every day to lessen that. Um, I've heard really cool ideas for, you know, elderly care. We're anticipating having an extreme shortage in the elderly care population and looking at technology, having smart homes, right? Blue, so many Bluetooth innovations where you can, you know, oversee a loved one with that sort of thing. So, um, you know, Definitely, I think time will tell where those shortages are, um, what they look like. But I think, you know, the biggest thing with employers, what we talk about is right now, healthcare employers are fighting over the same certified talent. Right. So if you are only going out and recruiting, saying, I'm only hiring a surge tech that's certified and has been doing it for three years, or I'm only hiring a sterile processing technician who's already certified and been doing it, you're just stealing from another hospital system, right? You're just stealing from another healthcare system. So rising tides rises all boats, right? What we need to be doing is creating that workforce. So that's why those partnerships with high schools, with the workforce offices, with the community colleges are so important because we can take people who maybe are not certified or have not considered that getting into healthcare was attainable for them, certify them based on the job that's already open. Right. So when we work with our employer partners, we say, okay, how many surge techs do you need to hire in the next not just year, but three years, five years, because if you want to solve the gap three years from now, that's who's sitting in the classrooms, right? So we kind of, we do work backwards with our employers to say, you know, you know, the gaps you have now, let's go ahead and solve them. We can have people trained and ready for you in six months or less, but what is your long-term problem that we're trying to solve too? And work backwards to say, okay, where are we going to find those people to get them certified? So that's, that's, how we look at it from a partnership perspective, but Dana, please, yeah. I mean, from the shortage. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely an interesting time in terms of just, just steeping demand for a variety of like patient, um, patient care roles. And, you know, as Jen mentioned, surgical techs are so high demand right now. And, and it's interesting because um, we're at a unique opportunity where there's all these gaps and it's, it's, I wouldn't say forcing, but it's it's increasing the likelihood that those employers are vocalizing to providers like us what their needs are. And it is certified, you know, qualified candidates. But what we're also hearing is all the little things that we didn't hear before. Like, what are the durable skills that you're looking for? What are the soft skills? You know, durable and soft skills are interchangeable. But what are those what are those things that are outside the norm that typically a, a traditional academic experience wouldn't necessarily touch on. So that gives us an opportunity 
as we develop new content, new programs, or enhance content and, new, and, and programs to uh, to integrate those types of trainings into our our core delivery. So um, we're able to you know not just meet the needs of of the core activities and and job tasks that that they expect someone to contribute on day one, but you know what are those ancillary skills that they're really looking for. Um, and I think that's important, not just for med certs, but for, for everyone to address those, those needs, because that's what employers are looking for in many cases, more so than actual demonstrated skills that, you know, are traditional to the role. So I have kind of a nerdy question. I mean, maybe it's a nerdy question. <laughs> um, you know, one thing about technology and innovating is like reducing the amounts of friction between what you want to happen, right? So if you want to lose weight, you um, you put the sweets further out uh, reach so that uh, there's more friction between you and the the, the Twinkies, right? Like uh, if you want to gain weight, you reduce the amount of friction between you and the Twinkies, you just put them in the nightstand next to your bed, right? Like um, So in, the, in tech, when you're thinking about the application of your platform, there was a traditional way of certifying people and there was a cert traditional way of educating them I read in your guys' documents speed and increasing or decreasing, you know, the time. And in my mind, that's friction. So what frictions are you guys um, solving when you think about the difference between the way you're doing business now and the way that traditionally we would have been educating people? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, if you if you compare a, a five or a six month certification career training program that MedCerts delivers to a two-year associate's degree that leads to the same job, mm -hmm. there's some fat that can be cut out there. Mm -hmm. And it's not mm -hmm. to, you know, um, you know, cast a shadow on that two-year associate's degree program because, you know, there's a great use and purpose behind that. Mm -hmm. However, to actually meet the needs of the job, you could argue that you don't need to take a full um, semester's worth of biology. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. can look at the, the act, actual needs of that role we can streamline the biology or the the the, the uh, um, anatomy and physiology that is requisite for that role and that's what we deliver so um, you know I hate to use that that term cutting out the fat but really um, th there's certain things that uh, that that we um, don't focus on at the interest of speed and agility to market um, for that for that graduate and I'm okay with cutting out the fat. I don't, I, you know, I don't think that, you know, <laughs> well, educators you think of it as fat, but, you know, Twinkies you know, and, yeah. I, I think of it like the, the fat is the friction to me. You have a kid that's sitting in a high school, an American high school somewhere, who's completely unaware of what's possible in the world. And the mm -hmm. distance between them and some of the certifications that you guys are putting people into, the distance is really closed by a couple of things. One, exposure. They just have to know that it, it's something you can do, um, you know, they see things on TV about somebody wearing a white coat, but they don't realize that there's just all these other ways that of which you could be working in the medical field um, if you're interested in it. Um, I do yeah. also think that time and money. So when you, how much is it going to cost me to go and get this particular degree or certification or AA and how long is it going to take me? Those are all pieces of friction. If, you, if it takes me a short amount of time, and it's not super expensive <clears throat> and it leads me to somewhere that's going to be productive that I can get this cert and do something in the world. I think there's so many American high school students that need to have as many of those possibilities put before them as possible. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, that's probably where you come in is like with the partnerships, like getting it before yeah. the people yeah. who need it. Yeah. Um, other things I think of as friction are transportation, mm -hmm. time to be in a brick and mortar facility. Um, things like childcare, things like, you know, coordinating family, you never know what someone's life looks like on the other side of trying to get into that career. Right. So those are also barriers that we look to eliminate. Oh, another really important one, access to technology, right? So mm. MedCerts provides a free learner laptop program. If someone doesn't have a device, that's not this guy, right. That they can complete their certification training on. We send them a laptop, no questions asked. They get through their program, get certified, send the laptop back to us. So um, there is definitely 
opportunities to cut out the Twinkies and the content, <laughs> but we're also looking at uh, the wraparound holistic learning environment for our students and saying, okay, what would traditionally be a barrier for someone to get into this career that's not just curriculum or content, but is, do you have the support, right? We've got every student one-on-one dedicated student success advisor. Do you have the device? Do you not have to go somewhere and sit in a classroom, but you can can learn after hours, after a job, after a sporting event, after you get home from high school, right? So there's a lot of things that we look for on the partnership side to solve as well. I mean, it feels like what you just said is the cutting out the the friction, not the fat um, of um, when you guys use the word asynchronous a couple of times here today, I don't think everybody knows what that means, but I mean, the idea that you have to go to a class at a certain time every day creates all the frictions that you just talked about, childcare, uh, transportation, how do I get there? Do I have time to sit in a uh, class at nine o'clock, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Um, and it sounds like you guys have cleared the brush on all of that. Um, I could at two in the morning, I could be working on something uh, that helps me get a certification. Can we talk about like some of the ones that you think are the most promising are the ones that are the most profitable in ter- terms of certifications? I don't mean to like make a contest out of them, but I'm just looking for um, I'm looking for opportunities that we don't spend enough time uh, exposing and telling people about. So are there some to you that are just clear winners that you think that are that are out of view for a lot of people that you would if a family member came to you and asked you hey what, what should i do with my kid or you know blah blah blah. i know you work on all these certs which ones would you be pushing for the most yeah i'll take that and this is this is tough for me because they're they're uh, they're all my babies and like <laughs> they all have they they're all, have all your darlings <laughs> they are and, and they're it's really just like if if you know that you want to get into the field of allied health, um, we have teams that their job is to help you decide what pathway you want to go. And Mm -hmm. like I said earlier, some people know they want to become a surgical tech and that's great. That's high demand. There's a distinct job title behind that. There's a clear career pathway. Whereas others, they may come in, they, they know they want to get into healthcare. Well, we help them decide, well, do you want to be on the patient care side of things? Do you want to be on the mental health side of things, whether that be traditional mental health or behavioral health, working with children with with autism, for example? Or do you want to be more on the administrative side? Do you want to be behind the scenes? Do you want Mm -hmm. to be exposed Mm -hmm. to to blood? Do you want to, you know, be in a lab? So like we ask all of those questions, um, unless again, someone comes in knowing exactly what they want to be. And so to kind of narrow it down, like we know what our most popular, most in-demand programs are, and they tend to be the ones that have the greatest awareness around them. Medical assistant is a great example. Everyone that goes to a doctor's office interacts, has an exchange with a medical assistant in most Mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a common job career, you know, title that people know they can aspire to be, but then there's lesser known fields like medical lab assistant. That's a great program for us, but not many people know what a medical lab assistant does. Sterile processing technician, that's a, that's a top five program for us. And again, there's not a whole lot of awareness around that, but for someone that wants a, again, in-demand career that's in a hospital, everyone knows what a hospital is. Everyone knows that devices and, and tools need to be cleaned be- between procedures. They may not know to what extent are the tools that are used, but uh, it, it, I guess the going back to your question, um, medical assistant, phlebotomy technician, sterile processing, surgical technician. Um, and w- which of those is the good one if you don't like blood? Well, out of those? Or any. Um, <laughs> any ones. I, I think you're get me get into the medical field with no blood, man. How do I get into the medical field with no blood? We have billing and coding, medical okay. front office, electronic health records, um, medical scribe, which is a great one. Um, medical scribes have replaced medical transcriptionists in many doctors' offices across the country, where that's um, it's um, essentially a scribe that's in the the doctor's office with the patient with the doctor that is um, entering a, a notes. patient re- record in real time. Okay, and which yeah. is which is kind of a great. Uh, 
parlay into one of the things that we've recently <laughs> developed, and that is uh, w- we've we've been working with AI now for um, about a year, and one of our more recent projects included a, a pretty unique blending of soft skills and hard skills within a um, within a patient in- interaction to where you as as the student are are looking at a uh, a digital avatar it's a patient you're actually having a, ver- a verbal conversation with that page patient using your microphone that patient speaking back to you you're working through a case but at the same time you you have to solve for that scenario but at the same time you're interacting with a an electronic health record mm-hmm. and you're mm-hmm. taking what you're learning in front of that patient and you're actually building that patient's record in real time and it's just a perfect example of blending those hard and those soft skills that um, mm-hmm. you know we're we're injecting across all of our programs. So you know, so interesting about this is I did not know that's how you get that particular job. But my doctor at some point started wheeling in the screen with him. That's it uh, to my doctor appointments, and there was some person that's it <laughs> on the other side of the screen. And first of all, I didn't know what that was, and I thought it was a little strange. And I'm in my mind, I probably just thought it was like a student. Uh, um, in training, but it's actually a job from what you're saying. It sounds like it's a job job and you have to be certified to do it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, So I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the technology too, because you just mentioned AI and I'm (laughs) wondering what you're bullish on when you think about AI and emerging technologies, what do you think is trendy? And then what do you think is actually your, something you're bullish on that it's going to change the game or make things different for us? I think AI is going to change the game completely, Um, not just in certification training, but, you know, across the board in all aspects of our life. And what I what I look at AI for is it it, it, it actually goes into a few different places, Um, starting with um, and I just mentioned a, a piece of that where you create interactions where you're solving problems in in real time with a a virtual patient or or a virtual colleague whoever it is and not just that but you know we're working on team team based interactions where you're not just talking with the patient but you also may have a doctor that's standing next to you you may have a lab technician that's on the other side of the room mm-hmm. and you're all communicating you're all working together to solve a problem in a virtual world that's safe that's repeatable that is capable of generating results of that interaction that demonstrate competency, which Mm -hmm. is a huge missing piece, especially as you're talking about those soft skills that I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of soft skill training that's out there, but you know, how do you truly measure teamwork? How do you measure communication skills outside Mm -hmm. of just, you know, Mm -hmm. checking a box? If AI can analyze a conversation and make judgments on how you handled situations and output a metric or using a rubric that we define and output metrics that are able to generate a gauge of competency that's something that that is tremendous if if that student or that graduate can take that proof of competency and hand it over to an employer and they understand that okay these these skills are based on a framework that's accepted there's competencies that have been measured against certain mm-hmm. metrics. Like, how well, what better way to be able to pass them over to, again, an employer to say, hey, I, you know, I've mastered these, these competencies. Don't just look at me because I have gained certification that demonstrates that I'm capable of performing these skills and these procedures and these processes. But I also hold these critical skills that are going to allow me to, to be positive on, on day one performing in, in the real world. When you say critical so skills, I, I guess that, what would be the, that? What would what would be one of those critical skills? Like as an example, communication skills, collaboration, empathy. Okay. Empathy is a huge one, especially in patient care situations. Oh my God! How do you teach empathy? How do you teach empathy? <laughs> yeah, right. right. I'm, I'm asking but, as a parent. <laughs> how do you oh, teach yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, tell me how that one works out. Right. Um. So. so I am really interested in this AI piece because when I think about certifications, I think about one of the things that gives me pause. There's a lot of people that are not um, fans of of tests and of passing a thing. And, you know, um, there's some states where the 
the bar pass rate is like under 50%, right? Like, so the number of people taking the bar and failing is like the majority of people. Um, and then there's all this anxiety about it. Like, you know, if you're going, will I pass, you know, I'm going for certification. Will I make it on the other end? What's the nature of like the, the assessment? What's the final boss after you've done all this training? Like, you know, what's the assessment like, what's the pass rate like, and what, what do people do? when they need to, when they need more help to pass. Yeah, we have, we have, um, you know, again, going back to the support that we provide. So we have teams that, that support our students from their, their date of enrollment all the way to, to them being placed into a job and beyond actually. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that team's responsibilities is, is ensuring that at the end of a training program through med certs, you know, again, we're, we're teaching not just to a test, but we're teaching, um, you know, skills that employers are looking for, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're teaching beyond just the test. So at the end of that experience, uh, our job is to kind of filter it down to, okay, this is what you need to re-prepare for before you sit for that exam. Because at the end of the day, that, that exam and that certification is your golden ticket to that job. Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. need that. Mm -hmm. So we place intense focus on ensuring that not only are all of the knowledge domains that are required for that certification exam are covered within our training, but then we refine it down at the very end to just, you know, ensure that they're refocused on what the exam expectations are going to be. So we, mm -hmm. we place a, a tremendous amount of focus on, on that. So we've talked a lot about the technology, the platform, the, the process and the potential and the possibilities, but Jennifer, I would ask you, like, what's your vision? Like, you know, you're going to be thinking about this all weekend because this is your job. Uh, and you think about this every day. There's something unique to you and your skills and ability to this that go beyond just the job. So in your dream of dreams and hope of hopes, what do you see as possible? And kind of like, what's your vision of what could happen here for the workforce development part? Yeah, well, I'll say for the vision for, for med certs, right, it's to get more people in the allied healthcare and healthcare IT. And as we as a company grow more people certified and in the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me personally, it's about access. It's about knowledge. I truly believe in my core education changes families. It makes general generational impact and how we as a society, society operate better together as we support the communities we're around, you know, and I think education is it is the pillar that we can all stand on, right? If we're getting people educated for jobs, they are making money. That makes the generational change and the generational impact for not just the one person we got the job, mm -hmm. but for their, for their immediate family, for their you know distant family. So um, for me personally, that vision is more access, more information at an earlier age and disrupting the notion that you have to go get a four-year degree to be successful because there are so many opportunities um and that you know lucky for me i get to work at a place where that mission mm -hmm. aligns with my, my personal mission in a better career faster right like that is what we wake up every day and as a team serve right getting people into these roles um without much if any debt at all and and that's what makes lasting change um you know we haven't talked about while we serve um high school and adult learners we also have a big focus on our military and their spouses mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so even just making sure that those populations are um getting into careers that support their family it's it's mission mission aligned for us that's a really great answer Jennifer, Thanks. I just want you to know <laughs> that is a really fantastic answer. And I think it hits on more than the technical applications of these things. There'd be a way for us to talk about this work in a very um, depersonalized way. But we do need two, two generation strategies. We do need people um, who get these certs and get jobs. That's great that they have certs and they have jobs. But at the same time, it's changing the game for them. It's changing the game for their families, for their trajectory for their lives. Uh, so you have some generational impact that you have in your job. You might just come to work every day at med search, just thinking I'm just doing a job. And in a lot of ways, no, no, no. You're kind of contributing to something that is going to take, is going to exist after you die. And I don't want to get morbid on you, but you know, we're all going to leave this <laughs> earth at some point. And are you going to leave? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> you know, are you going to leave behind something that actually you could be proud of? Like, you know, did your work mean something? Um, all right. I want to get a little bit personal with you guys just really quickly because, you know, there's a way to do these interviews and you're talking very much from your med cert with your med cert hat on or whatever. But, you know, I'm always interested in how people got to where they are. Um, partially because the way that I got to where I am was really roundabout and, and I didn't have a lot of great counseling and people didn't tell me what was possible. And there's all these jobs that I'm learning about that people have that are a complete mystery to me, like how you got there and how you became what you became. So what worked well for you guys in your own lives, uh, in terms of preparation to do what you do now, in terms of education, training, experiences, exposure? What worked well for you? What got you to where you are right now? Jen? Okay, so it's like, like you guys trying to okay, put so it off on each other. My story is not ab about myself. It's actually about my brother. Um, so I came from a, gen a, a family that, you know, generations have gone four-year college degree, right? I did not know about other opportunities. I'm a Clemson University grad. My whole team's tired of hearing me talk about it, but that was the <laughs> option, right? Like it was Clemson yeah. or nothing. Um, and my brother, who's four years younger than me, he has always been creative. He has always been so technical, works with his hands, thinks outside of the box. He has a skill set and his brain works in an incredible way that mine doesn't even come close to living up to. Mm -hmm. He didn't take the four year route. He was the first one to go to a community college. He got a welding degree. He is now a welding professor and the chair of his department at a community college in North Carolina. That opened my perspective entirely to mm -hmm. how do you get into the world of work? Like, what do you do if you're not great at test taking? You don't like studying, you don't want to go get a degree. You don't want to be in the business world, right? And so um, that for me opened my eyes to what is a community college? What does workforce development look like? How do people explore other and new careers? And so that life experience combined with um, a, a place I worked at called Tallow, where we were basically a LinkedIn for high school students, where they mm. could explore careers learn about what do you do after high school. Um, and there I got to work with Fortune 500 companies, some of the best, biggest, brightest companies like Lockheed Martin, like John Deere, like Boeing, who their corporate social responsibility arm was to just career exposure, right? Like how do you find out how you do the piping on the window of an airplane, right? How do you work on a rocket that's going to space. And so um, I come, I say, you know, my personal story sparked something. And then the job actually taught me the technical skills, right? Mm -hmm. So um, now it's my lifelong passion and mission to just continue down this workforce development world. But um, I, I, I will, I will end it there and pass it to you, Dana. It was uh, I love things kind too. of coming together. Uh, you know, I love your brother's story, though, because I think it's the American path that's possible now. Um, <laughs> you can discount uh, two years all you want, but my brother graduated with a two-year network administration degree with no debt and actually um, came out and was making 80K his first year out next yep. to people that had four-year degrees that were saddled with $100,000 uh, of, so that, that was my training in like, you know, what's possible in the world. Um, and I think med certs is for me, very interesting and very curious because it could be that thing that gets my brother and your brother into something that actually is going to work for them. It helps you get the, the house with the lawn, the Ford F-150, the lawnmower and the kit you know, the barbecue grill yep. out back, whatever the kit, the American kit. <laughs> um, um, so certify me, man, certify me so I can get the kit. Um, so Dana, yep. what about you? Like what worked in your life to get you to sit where you're sitting and to be doing the work that you're doing right now? Yeah, probably not as interesting as, as Jennifer's. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, all interesting. But, um, well, I, so I started out, um, went, went to undergrad um, to be a teacher and was a, a teacher for the first few years of my career um, in an inner city environment, which was great. Um, decided that what wasn't for me, so went back to school to get my MBA and knew that at some point I wanted to bridge the two um, 
bridge um, business and education in some way. Had no mm-hmm. idea, you know, how to do it. Found myself in um, in healthcare, um, running a chain of of uh, pharmacies and uh, home medical and durable medical equipment providers, and just fell into my lap that um, that. MedCerts uh, was being formed, um, and just so happened they they looked at my resume, so that I had the the education experience, but also the business experience, also the healthcare experience, um, and uh, that that was really it. Um, perfect alignment with exactly what mm-hmm. I wanted to do. Knew I wanted to be in education. I come from a family of educators, um, so it, it, it you know perfectly natural for me. Also have. Um, doctors in my family. So, you know, the, the healthcare side is, is a perfect extension of that. Um, and have just kind of grown to not grown to, I loved it since day one. Um, and I'll say too, that, you know, I have a son that is currently going to welding school and I love it. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. I also have a daughter that just graduated from Michigan state, um, a couple of years ago, got her four year degree. Absolutely love that as well. Um, but just knowing that there's all these different pathways that are, that are, underlooked um, or overlooked uh, that that we can solve for here at MedCerts. I mean, it, it drives me every day. Um, we're creating change. We've served over 100,000 students wow. um, over the last 15 years. And the bulk of those, believe it or not, have been in the last four years. Wow. So our, our, our trajectory of growth has just been like this since since day one. Um, and it's just, a, it's a great environment. Culture is wonderful. Um, everyone's out for the for the same goal and the same mission. So love it. I think that stories make the world go round. Uh, and we believe that at Ed Post, uh, the work that we do, we believe telling these stories matter. And, you know, you guys talked about a couple of school districts that you've worked with. Um, and I, you know, you just talked about 100,000 students served. Those, that's 100,000 stories um, that I think are very interesting. Parents should hear what those stories are. Because I think in a lot of ways, we're the, we're the home counselors for our, our students, for our kids. And a lot of times we're not operating with all the information of like what's possible. So I think these stories, the school districts that you work with, I'm sure have some clear winner stories. I just hope that MedCerts uh, continuously tries to put those stories out in the world because you're experiencing some things that I think people need to hear. Um, and they're, they're going to hear it better if they hear the individual stories, like the stories of students who actually did a thing. Um, if I'm a decision maker, I was once an elected official and, you know, people could always persuade me better with, with stories like tell me about a constituent that did a great thing that had their life changed or a young person that did a great thing. And it's weird, but that actually made a big difference in my policy decision-making, uh, you know, as an elected. So you guys are probably sitting on thousands of those stories. Hopefully you're getting them out in the world. Uh, you know, as we end, as we wrap up here, um, anything that you see that you're hopeful for that's coming down the pipe, you know, like, is it MedCert seeing anything like, you know, a year or five years into the future where you're just excited about some things that are coming down, uh, down the pipe? Well, you know, I'll, I'll say like, I, um, healthcare is my favorite. Like I, I, I am, I'm keenly interested in, in healthcare jobs and have a lot of awareness and a lot of specialty knowledge around that area. But, um, I'm excited about med looking, um, outward at other opportunities beyond healthcare. Mm. So, you know, we, we, I would say dabble in it if it's, it's just 10% of our business, but, um, I'd like to look at growing that. There's there's other areas that are underserved from a um, from a content perspective that's out there available in the market that aligns with the quality standards that should be there. Mm-hmm. And so what I'd like to do and what I'd like to see is MedCert's replicating the quality of programming that we offer and the delivery model that we offer it in and expand that out to a broader range of audience uh, audiences, a broader range of disciplines and a, a broader range of, uh, of demographics, you know, we're, we're primarily looking at entry level, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, those with little to no experience in the field, but we can do better at looking at upskilling, um, existing employer employees that want to move to the next level, but just don't know how to get there. And there may not be a certification tied to that movement, by the way, but looking at mobility, what can we do to kind of bridge that gap? 
That's great, Jennifer. But how about you? Do you see anything that you're excited about, like coming down uh, the lane on partnerships or places where we should be doing more work for the the partnerships moving forward? Well, the work never stops. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> the work never stops. But um, as Dana mentioned, you know, having to date trained over a hundred thousand people and seeing so much of that growth in the past couple of years, I think we're seeing an extreme appetite with our healthcare partners that understand the need for an online learning environment, understand that they need and want to train people the way they want them to be trained, right? Um, and so to date, MedCert works with the biggest healthcare systems, but also the ruralist, most rural healthcare systems, mm -hmm. right? The, mm -hmm. So there's um, no partner that we want to leave unturned. We have a solution that meets people where they're at. And I think there's just a ton of opportunity in front of us to just further collaborate and keep expanding those partnerships and, and keep growing. I want to thank you guys for coming today. Um, this has been a really great conversation. It touches one of my areas that I really care about because it's the intersection. I do think that education should lead to work. I do think that work should lead to a good life. Like it should be um, poverty ending work, not poverty sustaining work. So getting mm -hmm. certifications, getting uh, young people to understand the, the portfolio of opportunities that, that they can go into. Uh, I love your answer about the bloodless part of uh, healthcare because if I was you know, a student in high school right now, that would be my situation. I'd be like, yeah, I want to go do some work like that. But no, I don't want to pass out every day uh, looking at blood stuff. So you just need good counseling. You just need people to show you what's possible. You guys are doing that. Med certs, uh, you know, um, I would... I would probably encourage you guys to think of yourselves as public educators also, because I mean, that is actually the bulk of your work. You might think of yourselves as business people, but in actuality, 100,000 people served is 100,000 people who've been educated to do something with their life that I think is actually like worth talking about. And um, you should be proud of it. So thank you guys for giving us your time today. I really appreciate it. And um, for those of you listening and watching, please share the show and uh, make sure that others see it and hear it who you think actually would benefit from knowing more about med certs and the certifications that they offer and the work that they do. Thank you. As always, we'll see you on the next episode of Vector.